Hi, welcome to Life on the Rock. And tonight, our guest is Father Leo Patalinghug. Remember, he was on the show before and is about his work, uh, Grace Before Meals. And he cooked for Father Anthony and I uh, last time. And he's here, he's gonna talk about his new upcoming series on the network, uh, Savoring the Faith. So he's also gonna cook something for us again. So, and tonight we have Father Anthony. Welcome to the show. It's uh, good Doug, to be with you. Yeah, Doug uh, couldn't make it in, so uh, we're the compadres tonight. And, uh, <laughs> and I was asking what he wanted to talk about before, and uh, you're excited. We have a lot of events coming up for our community this summer. This year, yeah. Yep. Well, it's our 25th anniversary year. Mother Angelica founded us uh, May 2nd, 1987. So our community celebrating 25 years of life. Mm -hmm. um, and by God's providence, we have all kinds of ordinations happening. Uh, I'd just encourage our audience, tune in on May 31st. Brother Tarsisius is making his final vows. And then our seminarians, Brother Leonard and Brother Patrick, will be ordained priests on June 2nd. And on that same day, on June 2nd, Brother uh, John Paul and Brother Pascal will be ordained as deacons. So mm -hmm. they were just home visiting us last mm -hmm. week. They're very, uh, you can see they're getting sober. Mm -hmm. um, they've been so excited for so long. They're still excited, ready to burst out of seminary mm -hmm. uh, and come on the scene here full time with us in Irondale, which we're excited about. But you can see they're responding to that call. The seriousness of it is there, and, and it's beautiful to see you know what the Lord's doing with them. Yeah, I didn't think about the timing. 25 years of our community, and we have this massive uh, ordination. And it's all going to happen. All the ordinations are going to happen at the cathedral? Yes, June 2nd, and EWTN will carry mm -hmm. that uh, live. Right. So and again, I'd encourage our audience, June 2nd at 11 o'clock Central or noon Eastern time, to be with us, pray with us, uh, pray with our brothers, mm -hmm. celebrate with us. And there will, will there be other uh, diocesan men ordained? There's or? one young man from the diocese being ordained to okay. the priesthood that same day. So that's going to be a big, big day. The master of ceremonies is going to try to get the bishop through all of that in two hours. So. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you what do you tell the young men here that are about to? I know some of them have been at it a long time. Like John Paul's had over eight years of seminary, counting his work before he came to us. Leonard's been in the seminary like six or seven years, yes, right? Six years. Six yeah. years. So, uh, what do you tell them about the priesthood, and what do you uh, hope for them in the priesthood? On a human level, I just say uh, it's about time. I mean, you know, <laughs> we're waiting. We're waiting. Um, on a spiritual level, uh, I just told them last week as they get ordained to really savor the grace they receive mm -hmm. and to enter into it day by day that we don't want to, you know, they're not supposed to take over the world yesterday, but that they grow into this, uh, that this gift of ordination that they receive. And then the challenges associated with that, the priests hearing confessions, you know, for the first time and getting used to being comfortable actually offering the mass at the altar right, and, right. and then our priests preaching, you know, but right. to really allow the grace of you know, Jesus, the high priest, uh, to receive that, that change that happens in them, or Jesus, the servant, mm -hmm. um, that change that happens in, in the very level of their soul. Right. You know, I remember my, my first year at the end of it, I remember maybe it was the end of my second year, I, I realized I didn't remember my first year. It was like, <laughs> yeah, you come out of the gates and yeah, you think you're the Messiah or something, you know, you just, you, and then you kind of settle down and, uh, but you know, the other thing I remember from the first year too was hearing confessions and hearing about people's interior lives. Right. And you, sometimes you look at the media and you look at the culture and you can kind of get discouraged with the general trend of things. But then you see how God works in people's lives in such an intimate way as a priest, you see that. And you see how that, that relationship is so strong and how God is all powerful and his ways and thoughts are above ours. And, uh, and we're just in foolishness. That's this Sunday's reading, you know, that <laughs> uh, so far. But so it's like, yeah, the culture's going south, so to speak. But, you know, if someone's open to the Lord, God will work in their life. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 I, I remember, too, someone, another priest had told me, as a deacon, you preach one way, and as a priest, you begin to preach differently because 
suddenly that understanding of what it means to be father mm -hmm. uh, comes into play. And a lot of that, I think, is because of our time in the confessional and really understanding as a, a father understands his child, um, you have a different understanding of these souls that you're ministering to, mm -hmm. uh, a different uh, level of understanding of, of the, the suffering of so many people, the struggle of many, and you're sharing so many aspects, their joys, all the mm -hmm. things that go on in their life at so much of a, a real level. Mm -hmm. um, and even the experience you have yourself of feeling totally inadequate um, and yet recognizing the power of the Holy Spirit uh, in the grace of holy order, you know, right. that how he works right. in that. I remember, yeah, saying that one time to somebody that I, I feel like every day you get up and you're asked to do something you totally can't do. <laughs> and she kind of told me really quick, well, what do you think a parent feels like? <laughs> so I guess it's the same thing. What about yeah. preaching? I, I know, it seemed like more recently for me, I have come to realize just the power of God's word. And I know that's a big theme in Benedict's and his messages. And I think a general theme of his pontificate, but certainly doesn't start with him. We saw that, I mean, since the beginning, but Vatican II, clearly there's so many scriptural references, the catechism, there's so many scriptural reference, references, but how the word renews the church, mm -hmm. right? And I've, I've started to appreciate more the value of the role of preaching, evangelizing, that the priest has this uh, very grave responsibility to preach that word because the church needs to hear it, needs to hear the scriptural message, and that word has effect. It goes out and achieves its purposes, right? Right, right. And um, Our whole Christian life, the mm -hmm. life of faith, is that relationship. You know, it's just not knowing information. It's right. knowing this person of Jesus mm -hmm. and to fall in love with him in the scripture. Uh, and like you say, I mean, I think sometimes it can get frustrating as a priest when you're preaching. It's like, why are the people, they, you know, I said this once, I should not have to say it again. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yet it, that's what Jesus did. You know, how yeah. often in the, in the gospels yeah. we hear him saying, uh, you know, very much the same right. thing, you know, inviting us to that change and to enter into that yeah. union with him. Yeah, we all need to hear it. I, in fact, I, I, today I went to the noon mass, uh, I could celebrate it with Father Mitch, and it was so nice to hear somebody else preaching <laughs> <laughs> and to hear that word myself and his, and you could see, you know, the priest is supposed to live. You never say that when I'm up there. <laughs> <laughs> we hardly could celebrate, but uh, yeah, it is, uh, it's a lot of opportunity in the priesthood to do good, to affect people's lives. So uh, we ask you to pray for our brothers. Uh, they're preparing for their ordinations uh, June 2nd this summer. And uh, it's been a long time in coming for some of them. And uh, so we ask you for your prayers. And we're going to take a quick ba break. <laughs> and we'll be back with Father Leo Patalinghug. Hug, and he will be cooking for us and sharing his face. So don't go away. We'll be back in a minute. Hi, welcome back to Life on the Rock, and we have Father Leo Pateling Hug. So I'm not going to try to say that again tonight. So. <laughs> yeah, everyone just calls me Father Leo, and I tell people it's like paddling hug. hug. Exactly. It's yeah. kind of a contradiction, isn't it? It's, a, it's, it's, it's tough love. It's tough love, my last name. And it does mean in the Philippine language either Lord have mercy or spare me, O oh Lord. So. <laughs> How perfect it's Lent. I will make you beg for mercy. <laughs> now, everybody knows you for your cooking, but yes. your day job, so to speak, is what? Yeah. My real job <laughs> is to serve as the, preach of the priest of the Archdiocese of Baltimore. Mm -hmm. And um, about seven years ago, I was assigned to the faculty at Mount St. Mary's in Emmitsburg, right. where I have the good fortune of working with your seminarians. 
and I chair the pastoral theology program, uh, teach homiletics and spirituality. Mm -hmm. So I was really appreciative of hearing your words about preaching and how hard it is. Right, right. We should say, uh, we wanted to give a shout out uh, for anyone considering our community, Father Anthony. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Brother Patrick, or soon to be Father Patrick, mm -hmm. will be our, vo our vocation director. And I'd encourage any young man, if you see us at the Mass on television here, uh, you're interested in a Franciscan call, uh, give him a call. Send us an email, go to our website, uh, franciscanmissionaries.com, and uh, just look for some information and yeah. tap Father Patrick, Brother Patrick on the shoulder. Oh, that's right. <laughs> Expectant Father. Exactly. Okay. Expectant Father. And, and I'll, I'll say, too, that if you don't like wearing brown, you could always wear black. <laughs> Call me at the Archdiocese of Baltimore. Happy to send you to our vocation direct. Because we need preachers. Now edit that out. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but we, 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 what the reasons why I say that is because we need people everywhere. Uh, Christ says that the, uh, the harvest is ready and there are a lot of people who want to hear the Word of God. Mm -hmm. We just don't have many people who are speaking it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So do you, you work with the young people, young vocations for the Archdiocese? Well, I, I do in my own way. Yeah. Uh, you know, everyone is a vocation director right. in a sense, yeah. you know, and it really begins at home. Mm -hmm. And that simply means talking, families talking to their young people about how do you hear God? Where do you hear God? Right. And then, of course, as a priest, everywhere I preach and uh, I travel around the country uh, when I'm not at the seminary, <laughs> because that is my primary work, when I travel, I, I just remind people that there is a vocation in you. You just need to nurture it. You need right. to let that grow. And then you need to have the strength to fulfill it. And that's where the food comes in. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, with that segue, let's talk about exactly. that. Because you've, uh, you've got a lot of stuff on the back burner, so to speak, on the burner, front burner, I guess you First said. of all, it was a Freudian slip about you saying, we'll be right baked. <laughs> well, I'm part Italian, so I think with my stomach, but uh, you do have a new book out called Spicing Up Married, married life. life. Exactly. Right. Spicing and Married Life. It should be coming out, God willing, at the beginning of the, um, the fall wedding season. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, talk about an important vocation, marriage, right. Right. but what will really strengthen family life? Because the whole Grace Before Meals principle is about bringing families around the table. But I always, you know, thought to myself, as great as that is, the link for the family begins with the link of mom and dad. Mm -hmm. And therefore, mom and dad need some strengthening as well. And with the busy lives they have with taking care of the kids and working and driving them to soccer practice and ballet and mm -hmm. everywhere else, when does mom and dad have time to connect? Right. So the purpose of the book is to take 12 chapters, 12 annual uh, um, anniversaries and, and spread them out over a year. Mm -hmm. So like if you were married on December 15th, January 15th, have another little date night. Mm -hmm. And I take the wedding vows and basically aspects of love and relationship building, write a little bite sizable essay on it. <laughs> there it is again. <laughs> and then I also create a romantic meal just for two. Uh -huh. And then there's questions to engage conversation, prayers that they can say, uh -huh. and then a little area for them to maybe do some journaling. Because this is something that families, excuse me, that couples can do every year and see how far they've gone in their conversation. Mm -hmm. How have they deepened their love for each other? And so God willing, that's going to come out um, by wedding season in the fall. We're doing recipe testing and we've got a whole bunch of people, couples testing our recipes mm -hmm. now. We're going to get photos of our food. Exciting stuff. Well, can you give us an example of like a couple recipe that... Uh yeah, yeah, a romantic meal. For romance. Oh, yeah. yeah. As a matter of fact, one of them is going to be highlighted in the show that we're doing with EWTN, Savoring mm -hmm. Our Faith, mm -hmm. where I talk about romantic suppers, and I'll take some, uh, some beef skewers and some shrimp, and we're going to turn them into kebabs, uh. because there's nothing more romantic than actually sharing your food with each other. And so, you know, you know so couples can feed it to each other, just don't poke your eye out with <laughs> <laughs> So you're not doing like messy ribs or anything like that? Uh, we'll do messy ribs. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, there's a lot of different food varieties that uh -huh. we're using. So we're, we're going to hit a span of different types of cuisine, different, you know, international flavors. Now, does the couple prepare the meal together? Or does it take a turn or how does that work? You know, as far as the food is concerned, that's the means to the end. 
I couldn't care less if one made it for the other, if mm -hmm. both of them cooked it together. Or honestly, I don't care if they don't use my recipes. You can go ahead and call <laughs> Domino's, you know, for all. <laughs> the, the point is the food is a means to an end, and that wow. end is communion. Mm -hmm. However, I do say that grace before meals dot com, shameless plug, is, <laughs> <laughs> it really isn't about just the five second prayer uh, because grace is an action. It's an action of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And so when couples or a family come together and work together, that is also grace before meals. Okay. Maybe, uh, can you tell us too, you've got some other very exciting like secular projects going on. Yes. I know you were just on the phone with the Chicago Tribune, right? Yeah, yes, yeah. as a matter of fact. They, they wanted to learn more about Easter foods and particularly lamb. And so the staff writer, the food writer, uh, got in touch with me because of the show, Savoring Our Faith and Grace Before Meals, and I wanted to know why lamb? You know, why, why, why that food? And so to connect him to the message of the meal, we talked for about almost an hour, you wow. know, just yeah. he was so excited about it. And then I to told him that uh, it, it really begins when we understand why, is lambs, why are lambs so important to Jesus? And then you hear he'll separate the sheep from the goat. Uh, and why is that? And, and why does he call himself the shepherd? And why are we the flock? And I reminded him that lambs, although people think they're stupid animals, they're hardly stupid. They're hardly mm -hmm. stupid. What makes them incredibly virtuous is that they hear the shepherd's voice and they're obedient. And boy, do we need not more of that in our flock, right. you know, bringing it right. back to preaching. We can have the preaching and the shepherd calling out for the lamb, but are they actually listening? Right. And it's a relationship between uh, obedience to the Father. Now, you also were telling me about a, a PBS uh, series that you're working on. Can you tell us about that? Well, yeah, the PBS has been very interested in our show or our movement, Grace Before Meals. Mm -hmm. um, the difficulty is obviously going to be raising the funds for it so that we can actually get something out there. But they wrote us a letter of carriage several years ago when they first heard about it. Mm -hmm. And then we actually contacted them again and they renewed their enthusiasm. They said, we want your series. We mm -hmm. want your show. We mm -hmm. want you to be on with, you know, next to Julia Childs and Jacques mm -hmm. Pepin. I'm thinking, <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> because they saw not a Catholic message, but a universal message, which just happens to be Catholic, you know, right. that, that we're hungering. Right. And they want to promote good shows that will, what I would call encourage culture. Mm -hmm. But culture is gonna be encouraged when we encourage the family. And so they saw the message of Grace Before Meals fitting very well with their program style. And what is the core of that message uh, that you would give to families out there? Because um, it's not just about you know, gourmet food or oh, something. Oh, no, not yeah. at all, not at all. Um, it, it, it's to be very attentive to the fast food mentality. Mm -hmm. Now, again, I have no trouble with fast food. I want to tell people that, and I firmly believe that the colonel will one day be beatified as saint. <laughs> 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 well, you know, hey, prayers and grace can happen. <laughs> but the mentality, I think we've abused the mentality of fast food, and that means that we're less patient, we don't spend time with each other, and we're not attentive to what young people are putting inside of them. And I'm not talking just about food, but I'm talking about the food for the thought, food for the heart, food for the soul. And so my encouragement is to turn through grace the dinner table into a desk table mm. where the greatest lessons in life are learned, mm. just like Jesus did. And it seems like such powerful things happen in the family when you slow down and just spend some FaceTime together. Oh yeah. Right, I mean sometimes, you know, it seems like parents sometimes will feel so inadequate about how they're gonna guide or teach, but it just begins with time, doesn't it? Isn't that yeah. one reason why Sabbath day is a commandment? You know, right. I mean, it's, a com it's not right. a suggestion. Rest, do what we do as a universal family. And right. we're just so busy and running around, and that's why the preaching is so essential. It is mother church, and Father, representing God the Father, speaking to his children. And that's why the word homily, and I know that your seminarians will be like, oh, is this feels like class again. <laughs> <laughs> the word homily means familiar conversation. 
It shows up in the road to Emmaus. And you might think it was when Jesus was talking. Nope, it was when the two men were talking with each other. They were having a homily. They were talking as familiar, as friends. And then Jesus enters in. And guess what that conversation led to? Mm -hmm. The Eucharist, mm -hmm. <laughs> communion. Right. It's like an image of like evangelization leading to the Eucharist. Right? Yeah, and the evangelization is unique though because sometimes people hear that word evangelization mm -hmm. and they could be, you know, I don't want to hear no preacher talking to me about Jesus and God mm -hmm. and just, you know, judging me. This isn't the same way. That's why the word homily is about father talking with his children in a loving family style way. Right. Let's talk about uh, food addictions and some of the misuse of food. Mm -hmm. I know you address that obviously with a spiritual answer. Uh, can you tell us about that? I can. Mm -hmm. I'm actually writing some forewords and some blurbs for other Catholics who are writing about the food and faith connection mm -hmm. as well. And it really begins when we as a society do not address the true hunger. What are the hungers in, in the world? And if family and goodness doesn't satisfy it, then we look elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And the addictive principles mm -hmm. of our world just basically loves to put things in our food that makes us want more. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, on a biologic level, salt and sugar, very addictive. Caffeine, very addictive. So what do they put in sodas, which tastes like salt, you know, and, and the popness of it all in caffeine, yeah. it just becomes addictive. Mm -hmm. And so what we've got to do in order to break an addiction, is to start a good addiction, right. start a good habit. Mm -hmm. You break a, ha a bad habit by starting a good one, and that would be healthier, good living, mm -hmm. a balanced diet, a mm -hmm. balanced life, mm -hmm. which, has, um, which has things that feed not just the body, but also the spirit, mm -hmm. also the sense of community. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why I love the Mass. It's such a balanced meal. <clears throat> you get food for the soul, you get food for the body, you get that family connection, you know, that mm -hmm. sign of peace is so beautiful. It just shows that we have a, a balanced understanding of worship. Now you talk about what you're trying to do as a movement and not a ministry. Yeah, thank what's, you. What's yeah. the distinction? <laughs> well, you know, um, I think we've got to pay attention to the fact that when people see a priest cooking, they're immediately intrigued because they don't think that we, you know, do normal things. Right. Are you yeah. kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> We're always doing uh -huh. things that are human, right. so we eat. But when you see a priest doing it, you think, oh my gosh, what's, what's that about? And so they automatically call Grace Before Meals a ministry. Mm -hmm. But the word ministry has some, you know, ecclesiological ramifications. It, it touches on the level of church. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we tell people, you don't have to be a priest to do what I do. Mm -hmm. It's a movement uh, that encourages the apostolate of the family. Mm -hmm. In other words, I'm trying to get the family to move closer together. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you don't have to be a consecrated virgin or a nun or a sister or a deacon to cook with your, you just have to be alive, <laughs> you right. know? <laughs> you just have to be hungry. Mm -hmm. And who is that? Everyone. Everyone. And that's a good segue too to the next point I want to ask you about. You, you're you have some initiatives about outreach to the poor and Do. volunteerism. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, you know, if, if ever Grace Before Meals ever gets big enough, and it, we're international now, but obviously when I mean big enough, the stability of the resources, I want to set up foundations. Um, two of them in particular. One will be direct food for the poor. I just got back from the Philippines. I was with my family on a family vacation. All 30-something of us, you know, <laughs> we were island hopping. It was... <laughs> It was amazing. Mm -hmm. And as part of my work, I stopped and, and did some work at Berghoff, which is a German cooking ware company. They invited me to their big Manila store and uh, we, we cooked to raise money and awareness for the victims of the typhoon mm -hmm. that, uh, that the Filipinos experienced a few months ago. And so our objective was to just raise awareness because my goodness, they needed food. Right. So I'd love to do things that directly will feed hungry, right. poor people. Right. However, Mother Teresa was clear in saying at the communion breakfast, we Americans are very poor. Right. We are starving for spirituality. So what I'd love to do is get an initiative of professional chefs or students who are going to become professional chefs to dedicate some time and teach some culinary skills to families, to give families an opportunity just to eat together and talk together. That will, in a sense, remind professional chefs that their food 
could become a sacramental of sorts, mm. you know, because it reminds you of the sacred nature of communion and family. And that when you give charity to somebody, when you dedicate your time, it can in a sense become a corporal work of mercy. Right. And so I'd love for professional chefs to not just see feed the body, but also to feed the soul. And, and I guarantee you, they will walk away from an experience like that being fed themselves. Yeah, that's an important point about the fellowship of the church, the communion of the church, that it always has this openness, this invitation yeah. to others. Thank yeah. God for Lenten fish fries from the Knights of Columbus, that's all <laughs> I can say. <laughs> thank God for those pancake <laughs> breakfasts, you know, and thank God for our feast days, which I'm trying to bring back. Right. That's why the book Grace Before Meal celebrates yeah. not just religious feast days, but secular feast days to show that there's a religiosity to it. Right. Well, we're going to take a short break, and we'll be back with Father Leo, and he's going to make us something special, and we're going to pray before we eat it this year. So uh, <laughs> don't go away. We'll be back in a minute. <laughs> It is time to eat. <laughs> My favorite part of every Father Leo visit there. <laughs> so here's what we're going to be making. Uh, this actually is a chapter in my book for Mother's Day uh, because mothers and food, they go hand in hand. You know, I mean, obviously, since the moment we were conceived, we've always been eating. You know, so if you've got a belly button, <laughs> food. <laughs> but you know, that's why I think our food and our faith are connected because sometimes people... Um, they make a decision not to bring life into this world because they're afraid that God won't provide. I mean, if you hear it, they'll say, we have another mouth to feed. You know, I can't take care of that child. And therefore, if we increase our faith in God, I guarantee you people will have more virtue, more strength, more faith to know this is going to be tough, but God will provide. He did it 40 years in the, in the desert. You know, he does it in every Eucharist. And so that's why I want to do a special shout out and tribute to moms with this particular dish. Now, we're going to be making Monte Cristo sandwiches. Mm. Okay, and this is, again, the Mother's Day dish that I recommend. Um, people ask, well, what's a Monte Cristo sandwich? And I say, do you know what a McGriddle is? Do you know I, mean, what I haven't had one. You no. haven't? <laughs> <laughs> McGriddles are basically a savory and sweet breakfast sandwich. But I actually had this um, in San Francisco in this place, and I thought, oh my gosh, this has got to be something we use. So we're, we're going to make these, and I'm going to have you do some work. All, all right? right? All right. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are always so scared when I come. <laughs> so what we're going to do is I'm going to have you beat some eggs. I'm going to actually add a few things to it, though. So we've got some eggs right here. I'm going to add to it a little bit of vanilla extract and some pure vanilla extract because I want to make this sweet, almost like uh, that's a little bit more than a teaspoon. Yeah. So, uh, Father Anthony <laughs> don't beat this one. <laughs> exactly. Go ahead, get your aggression out there. <laughs> and then what we're going to do, um, Father, is we are going to show you what we've got here. We've got some ham. We've got some butter. We've got some mint leaves. And we've got some brie cheese. And we have also have some fruit as well. You're, that's beautiful. Look at you. You're like a pro. <laughs> um, and now what we're going to do is we're going to actually just start assembling sandwiches. And the reason why, that's perfect. So let me have you guys put these out like you're going to assemble a sandwich. Yeah, you're going to wash your hands. <laughs> All right. So um, the reason why we're doing this particular meal is because I think for Mother's Day, you know how everyone for Mother's Day, they love going to church. Well, they should love to go to church, back to Mother Church, <laughs> but they also love to have brunch. So this will be a perfect brunch kind of meal. So go ahead, put these all out. We'll all make a sandwich. I'll make one, show you what it's like, then you can all make it. And the little trick for this is I actually let this bread sit out because I want to use the bread when it's a little dry. Um, and I think in the show, we talk about how nothing goes to waste, even a crumb 
represents the Eucharist once it's consecrated. And so we're going to give new life to this bread. And the way we're going to do that, very simply, is by basically making a little sandwich. So go for it. Taking a little bit of ham on each one. Okay. There you go. And I think we can actually put two slices on each one of these bad boys. So <laughs> join them all together. That's right. Because mom is generous. <laughs> and then easy is pie. We just simply put in a little bit of this brie cheese. Now this brie cheese is kind of like pretty expensive. And that's why this is something that we don't want to do regularly. But if you have Swiss, we can use Swiss as well. Just so, put it out there. And you can eat the, uh, the wax edges there? Yeah, the rind you can use as well <laughs> because it's going to melt all together beautifully. Mm -hmm. And that creates the pungency that uh, makes this so unique because once we've got the sandwich folded over, we're gonna get these bad boys kind of heated up. And we are going to uh, cook these in some butter. Let it rest and then we're gonna actually do the, the berries. But before we do that, here's what has to happen. And we kind of create a little bit of a, uh, kind of create a little bit of a, uh, um, a little assembly line. So a little bit of butter in here. Now everyone always complains whenever I cook with butter. And I say, blame God. <laughs> he made it taste so good. And we are going to try to practice this most importantly in moderation. So once this fries up, once this kind of heats up, that is, we are going to move quickly because these cook so quickly. Mm -hmm. And how we're going to do it is we're going to put a little bit in this egg wash that's going to be seasoned, I mean, uh, flavored with some of that delicious sweetness of the, of the uh, vanilla. And here's the unique part about my version. I actually crust it now in some breadcrumbs, so Italian seasoned breadcrumbs, because we've got salty, we've got savory, we've got creamy, <laughs> we've got sweet. This is like a party in your mouth. Now that this is done, we simply turn this heat down. I will be the one to get my hand dirty. Don't you worry about that. <laughs> And then, <laughs> brother's kind of grossing out, right? <laughs> I didn't think it was going to be this involved. Right? <laughs> this is why cooking for everybody is a labor of love. It definitely is going to require you to get your hands dirty a little bit. But you can see, super simple cleanup at the end of the day. That's why kids can make this for mom, and dads can help and do what we call grace after meals, which is doing the dishes, all right? <laughs> so we've got this going on, delicious. This is going to cook up. This one is going to cook up quicker because I've got a higher heat going. In it goes, put these away because now we go to the next part of this meal, which is going to be the berries, which is the fun part. Now you can smell that, it smells pretty good. A lot of deliciousness going on right now. <laughs> Flip this over so we don't cross contaminate. So all that brie is going to melt in there and everything. All that brie is going to melt in there, especially since I'm going to turn this down a little bit and it's not going to burn, God willing. This is why my movement's called Grace Before Meals, all right? <laughs> We're praying that it all works out and that nothing bad happens, all right? So this is going to continue to cook down. That's looking good. Now I'm definitely going to turn the heat down because I want to cook it and take a little bit more time. Now, I'm always so worried when I cook indoors, especially in a place that may not be used to a lot of smoke, because I set the alarm off once <laughs> in a nursing home of all places. So embarrassing. And the reason why I didn't get fined was because uh, the fire chief said, that's some really good food. <laughs> Again, it goes to show that we can win people over by going through their stomachs, all right? <laughs> and that's kind of what Jesus did. So here's what we're going to do is we're just going to section off some of these berries, put them off to the side, and, and I just need to cut these out. Fast. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I'm going to have you do next, okay? So we're going to just kind of slice these out. That's your martial arts background. <laughs> this is my martial arts background. No fear. <laughs> um, well, you know, I do consider Maybe you should cooking. look at that when you cut. Like that? <laughs> what, do you, what do you mean? Oh, you're looking at Father Anthony. Oh, yeah, no, because here's why, right? <laughs> Again, we're praying. No, uh, I, I consider these knives kind of like the weapons of our faith. You just have to know how to use them. 
You know, you have to practice it. You know, some people are very afraid to pray. Some people are, are deathly afraid to pick up a rosary. Uh, and it does take practice. And you're going to be a little bulky at first, and things will go slow. But that's OK. You will learn it. Let's have you guys give it a try. Let You're me cut ready. one top off. Okay. First of all, the principle is to always make sure that you create a solid base. And then what you do with your fingers is you kind of wrap them in. Nope, fingers oh, got to touch. Like, <laughs> there it is, perfect. <laughs> that way you are you got it. Oh, uh, you kind of guide it with the knuckle? Exactly. Oh, you okay. let it slide across your knuckle. That uh. way you don't burn your knuckle. I mean, you don't right. cut your finger. You'll just slide it along the knuckle, and then everything mm. will be A-OK. -okay. All right, now I'm going to do a little crazy technique here. I'm actually going to get these heating up one at a time by putting them all in this one pan so that they kind of continue to melt. The cheese continues to melt. I'm going to keep flipping them over, interchanging it, because I'm going to use this pan next to saute these, these delicious little fruits, which is going to serve as kind of like a glaze for all of this. And here we go, a little plate off action to the side. Great. You're doing pretty well there. Maybe I could have you on my show, actually. I do have you on my show. You have to change it to an hour show. I we, think. We have <laughs> All right. So we've got some fresh berries that we're just going to kind of saute in this butter. And you did perfectly with that. Now I'm going to ask you to just hand that over. I'm going to take a little bit of mint. I'm going to do a quick little chiffonade on these mint leaves, some fresh mint leaves, which is basically kind of shredding them up. And the way we do this is roll them up super fine like that. And then we make nice little ribbons, very simple, very quickly done, because these mint will give a nice brightness to the entire meal. And because I love fire, we're going to add <laughs> something to it. And by the way, I want to thank your props guy for getting us this spice rum with this. <laughs> it's a family show, so we're doing that. It's a hula dancer. Right? We're going to add a little bit of rum here to deglaze the pan and to help us make sure that we cook it all out. We're going to light it on fire. And that's always a lot of fun. Then we're going to add eventually some simple syrup to it as well. So, what kind some, of syrup is that? This is a maple syrup because this is going to serve as kind of like the base, a little service of base for our, um, our plating techniques. Okay, great. This is, I know, definitely done. We're going to add this back on here. And now I think it's time to plate. We can just do that one last one. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> and this is where, again, the cleanup process involves the entire family. <laughs> Here's what I'm going to do now, is I'm going to actually plate some of these for everybody. And can you smell the oh, different flavors? Yummy. Does it smell good? You know, yeah. like I mentioned to people when I give conferences, this smell is what I want to capture and use for incense at church. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason is because it's in a sense like uh, that odor just calls you. And uh, I call this the odor of sanctity. <laughs> you know, you ask yourself, what does the odor of sanctity smell like? Because I mean, if you were to think about some of our, our saints, they probably did not smell good. They were working with the poor. They were working in the heat. So what did they smell like? Well, I, I think it's not about a sense, but it's, you know, that you, you have it within your nose, but, but it's more of like a sense of an experience of comfort. Once you're with them, you're immediately comforted. And there are some foods that just immediately give you comfort. Now, this is a beautiful presentation, and here's why we do it this way. We're going to put the syrup on the bottom so that the... Um, mm. Yeah, it smells good, doesn't it? <laughs> Use that rum. <laughs> and by the way, I got to tell you, people are sometimes afraid to work with alcohol. I actually lead a retreat in Napa Valley. And actually, you know, that'll be a great thing to talk about because it's actually, we've got some spaces available too where we talk about sacramental wines. And we talk about how food, especially wine, is a way to know Jesus better. As a matter of fact, Jesus revealed himself through wine. And we lead them through a, um, a, a meditation. I'd say, 
you must become a grape seed. And that grape seed will eventually become a plant, pruned, transformed, eventually transubstantiated. And the same thing happens to us in our faith. We take on a change, and even though, our even though we uh, still look the same, our substance changes. We become one with Christ. And so, here's what we're going to do. We're going to cut this on an angle. There you go. All right. And guess what? We'll have a little taste test for it all. Put it out just like this to kind of create some, some dynamics here with the food. And, uh, oh look, that cheese is perfectly me melted. And then just for the presentation of it all too, I always like to add a little bit of fresh you know, herbs to it. So we'll just add that in there, kind of pretty. And let's see about giving a taste test. Uh, <laughs> well, should we pray the family rose? For, <laughs> <laughs> for the viewers, last year, or the last time I did this, I so caught yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you dug right into it. <laughs> all right, no, God bless this food. God bless all of those who go without. And uh, God bless all of the movements that do what they can to feed the hungry, especially those who hunger in their soul. Amen. Amen. So go ahead and give a little taste test and you can pick it up and dip, dip your in fingers and you know, get your hands in there. Exactly. And that way you get some of that syrup without it being super obnoxious. Mm. What do you think? That's really Tastes good. Tastes good. And I think we've got some, some of the audience members as well that might come in as well. So audience members, come on in. Mm -hmm. You know what? I think I need to have a young person taste one of these yeah. too. Come on in. Yeah. Bon appetit. I prayed for already. So it is now literally in a sense a sacramental because dad, you got to get so in here too, too right? Yeah. Because dad's got to feed people as well. <laughs> because hopefully this will remind you of... Is it, oh, it's good. <laughs> so good she had to whisper, just like in church. <laughs> Go ahead, come in here and just cra grab a little here. I think Jesus multiplied, so I think we're in good shape. So go ahead. Oh, look, that cheese is perfectly melted. So go ahead, take a piece and then dunk it in the, dunk it in the sauce. What do you think, huh? Now, you all are here because you're, what, is she, what do you think? It's good? <laughs> You're not lying to a priest, are you? <laughs> I love it. I love it. Now, here's what I love to do. Whenever I do my presentations, fathers, mm -hmm. I, I love to just get like a question or start asking families questions about food. And maybe one, one you can share with me is, what's your favorite meal and why? Anyone want to do it? Now I'm putting them on the spot. And if they need help, fathers, you can certainly <laughs> chime in. <laughs> a favorite meal and why? Meal of the day? Oh, uh, well, gosh, you sound like a <laughs> hobbit. <laughs> <laughs> Third breakfast, just, you know, your favorite meal, the one that brings back the most comfort for you and your family. Like a particular food? Like a particular, all. yeah, menu. You know, all of them are good, huh? <laughs> good I do a lot of the cooking. So. You do a lot of the cooking? Is there one that they love to ask you for? Uh, pizzas. I pizzas? Make homemade pizzas with homemade dough, and they love that. So is that right? That. Yeah. Well, what I'm going to do then is ask you to send to me that recipe, and we'll put it on my website. <laughs> <laughs> How about for you? I like pastas. Pastas? So we've got an Italian feel here. What about you? I was going to say lasagna. Because lasagna? Because everybody in my family loves it, so I like like serving it. That's awesome. Fathers, what about you? I just love this. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. So let's cut up another one. Let's cut up another one of the sandwiches. That's right. All right. We will cut this up. We'll do it this way, too, to make it even more bite sizable. For me, I tell people that food as a sacramental, <laughs> come on in. <laughs> food as a sacramental because it brings back a memory of the sacred. Mm -hmm. uh, and you think about Christ when he says, do this in memory of me. I like to remind people, how do you want to remember Jesus? And the way Jesus wants to be remembered is obviously not just you know, dying on the cross, but loving his people through the food. And that's why he kind of gives himself in food. And in the gospels, there is so many meals, right? He has meals at the tax collector's homes. Yeah. And 
but also be the tax fry. collector in particular, <laughs> Zacchaeus, who mm. was the short tax collector. That's <laughs> why you brought him up. <laughs> you know, there's a cute little story about that for me as well. Um, when I met the Holy Father, John Paul II, there was a huge crowd of people and we were all ready to reach out and shake hands, but the problem was there was a really tall seminarian blocking my way. <laughs> so I did a Zacchaeus and I climbed on top of the seminary. <laughs> and I'm trying to reach out to the Holy Father and I remember he pulled me in and he kind of gave that look that just pierces your soul. And, and the first thing I could think was, please stop looking in my soul. <laughs> but then he said to me, be a good priest. You know, and I think to myself, being a good priest, what does that mean besides just simply, you know, offering the sacraments and, and offering all of the sacred rites and being available for your people and, you know, preaching the word? Well, I think Jesus said, you know, to Peter at the very end, if you really love me, then make sure you feed my sheep. And that's why, um, that's why with this menu, I just think this is an opportunity for people to really experience God's blessing. And please don't let this sauce go to waste <laughs> because it has that rum in it. <laughs> Give that a try there. Is there anything else you want to tell us about your new book about uh, for marriages? Um, yeah. Maybe a particular chap chapter that's your favorite? Yep, you like that? By the way? Yeah. <laughs> for me, one of my favorite uh, chapters in that book is, uh, is the end because the end it says, till death do you part. Mm -hmm. and, and with that death do you part, um, what, what's kind of sad for me is that like, you know, couples will eventually experience their spouses passing on. And there is a story in particular that I love because it's about a, a very senior woman who actually runs a marathon in honor of her husband who passed, out, passed away. Oh, wow. And this was in Hawaii. And I remember I was sitting at breakfast because I was giving a mission in Hawaii, St. Augustine Church in Hawaii, beautiful place. And I was sitting at breakfast and I was thinking, how am I gonna end this book? How am I gonna end this book? And I look at the paper and it shows that story of this woman who was running this marathon for her husband. She's a senior woman, a marathon. I can't run it now. <laughs> <laughs> and she said there were many times she stopped, many times she couldn't continue but it took her hours and hours and hours and she finally made it through. And, uh, and that was for me, the, the book's ending mm. because it's about getting to the finish line. Mm -hmm. You know, m marriage is about fidelity. It's not a sprint, it's a marathon. And the thing she said that kept her going was that she said she could sense her husband beckoning her to the finish line. Wow. Mm. And that finish line for us means a wedding banquet <laughs> with a lot of food <laughs> where you don't gain weight. <laughs> All right. So, Dad, will these kids get a chance to taste some of this, even with the rum in it? Because it's kind of cooked. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Give that little taste test there. And the reason why I wanted to put the rum into it is because it gives families. Guys, give that a go there. And we've got some more. Uh, utensils, I'm sure. Oh no, we can't double dip. <laughs> Here's another spoon. Uh -huh. Is because again, I want to give people and families the opportunity to talk about something like alcohol, but in a positive way. Because if families again don't talk about it as a family, someone else will give them a message. Right. And that message, once they eat it up or drink it up, it can kill them. Mm -hmm. So, what do you that's think a, of that sauce? Good. Is it tasty? <laughs> <laughs> certainly, yeah, the family meal can teach that temperance in all things, mm -hmm. you know, and, and a balanced life. But we thank you so much uh, for joining us. My and pleasure. I thank know you've got to run. Thank all of you thank all you. for joining yeah. us, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we're going to thank you so much for joining us, and we're going to see you next week. And Father Leo and I will give you a blessing. May our Heavenly Father shine His face upon you and give you His peace. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. We'll see you next week. <laughs> exactly. <laughs>